Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. I am Kamisa Kamara, and I'm the Director for External Affairs and Africa Policy at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. I am delighted and honored to chair this high-level panel of African leaders and policymakers this morning. COP26 starts in just three days, and world leaders are already on their way to Scotland. There's obviously an urgency to address the most pressing issues regarding climate change, most particularly for the African continent. Climate finance, how do we make it work? Who pays for what? How can African economies develop without investing in natural gas reserves? Emissions reductions, how do we integrate adapted policies within national development plans? We will try and answer some of these important questions during this precious hour. Now, let me turn to our panelists. Your Excellency, Madam President, we're honored to host you today. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah. Honorable Tony Blair, good morning, and thank you for being with us. Dr. Vera Songwe, nice to see you again, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Mr. Vice President, uh, Professor Ostin Bajo will join us just in just a few minutes. So let me just, um, let me jump right in. Um, Madam President, I will ask you the first question. Since coming into power, you've had a lot to handle, the COVID-19 crisis for one. Could you tell us where climate change sits in your list of priorities? Thank you, Kamisa, for that uh, very nice question. And, um, uh, as we are heading to uh, Glasgow, it is um, understandable that the debate is uh, fierce on available options uh, towards the zero emissions to survey the earth from the impacts of climate change. So for the case of uh, Tanzania, For the case of Tanzania, where natural resources sectors, that's agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, represent about 30% of our gross domestic product, climate change has devastating effects for sure. During the last decade, Tanzania lost on average of 96.96.6 million a year in agricultural sector alone due to drought affecting maize and legume seeds. The data from emergency events database show that the primary natural hazard causes of major disaster in the last uh, two decades are floods, epidemics, droughts, and storms. And in the last two decades, cases where people required immediate assistance, 91% was a result of drought. Similarly, in the last five years, the threat from tropical cyclones, including Kenneth, Adai, and Jobo, have been experienced in the eastern coast of Tanzania. So, for Tanzania, there's also a fall in crops or crop yield that are often used as raw material in agro-industrial processing, which has affected overall country production. And so, as you are aware, the Zanzibar, uh, Tanzania, we are two parties united. The other side is Zanzibar. And Zanzibar is heavily affected by the climate change. We can vividly see the rise of temperatures, rising sea level because it's uh, islands, saltwater intrusion and inundation, reduced availability of fresh water, and increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather conditions. So these weather heats have resulted into direct loss and damage to people's property infrastructure and loss of coastal and marine resources. So estimates show that climate change has cost Tanzania about two to 3% of GDP annually, which is about uh, 2 billion US dollars. And in particular, as we are aware, uh, women and young people 
are mostly affected by such unpredictability. So despite the disappointments in the multi, uh, multilateral front, Tanzania has not stood idle. We have instituted a number of um, initiatives to address climate challenges. We have um, in place a national climate change response strategy and the national determined contributions as we were required by the Paris Agreement. And we do have some several sectoral program strategies and plans. So these policies have led us to uh, prioritize sectors for adaptation, such as agriculture, water, health, livestock, fisheries, tourism, infrastructure, and blue economy. And so in enhancing our resilience to the advance, adverse impacts of climate change, both soft and hard technologies are being applied. And um, we have been trying to improve the accessibility of water. And in many parts of our country, around 60 to 62% of the people um, do have access to uh, safe and uh, clean water. And this is in line with the targets to attain 100% water accessibility by 2030, set in our plans and in our NDC. And for the coastal areas, we have taken some measures of constructing sea walls, drains, and drainage system so as to um, protect these areas to be harmed by the effects of climate change. Um, for the case of uh, climate change mitigation, uh, through the National Determined Contribution, Tanzania has set a target of reducing greenhouse gases emissions economy wide between 30 to 35 percent by 2030. And the construction of the, we are, we are, we are heading to the, um, to the use of green uh, energy. And with that, we are heading to the uh, construction of the hydropower project, which would produce about 2,115 megawatts of electricity. And also with the standard uh, gauge railway project of about 1,457 kilometers, we're expecting to reduce the emissions in transport sector. Because in Tanzania, we do have about 92, 92,000 or 92 million lorries passing by in transit because uh, Tanzania is uh, neighboring eight landlocked countries. So we do have a lot to transit uh, to other neighboring countries. And so we have a lot of lorries in, on our roads, which we are expecting to to take them off road and so to reduce emissions. But then, uh, moreover, Tanzania has a has a total uh, total area of forty eight point uh, one million hectares of forest, which provide global services for carbon sequestration, and about thirty two percent of the total land area is reserved for further generation. It's a reserve land for our future generation. And so it's all full of forests. And in the last two decades, Tanzania has been undertaking tree planting campaign where around 96 million trees are planted annually through local government authorities. So Tanzania is a lot to offer to the world in reducing um, uh, greenhouses uh, emission, but we are expecting the world to come our, 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 to come on our way for financing so that we can implement the adaptation uh, adaptation um, processes with the climate change. Thank you so much, Madam President. You've mentioned dry drought, the rise of temperatures loss in crops and economic growth, but also some of the responses that Tanzania has um, uh, 
brought to this issue of climate change in your country, including a national climate change response strategy, the use of, of green energy, um, yes. and the reduction of emissions in transport. Yes. Um, and this is, this is all uh, well noted. Let me, let me turn to um, the, the Honorable Tony Blair uh, for, for a minute. Mr. Tony Blair, I was wondering whether you could give us a, a Western perspective here. How well do you think decision makers in the West understand the issues that Madam President has just highlighted? And what more can African leaders do to highlight them, most specifically at COP26? Thanks very much, Commissioner, and, and thank you everyone for participating um, <clears throat> in this discussion, which is, which is hugely important because essentially what Africa is trying to balance uh, 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 two things. The need, obviously, for action on, on the climate with the need to develop, because there are still very large numbers of people in Africa living in poverty without access to electricity, uh, without, therefore, access to the best opportunities in education and healthcare. There's still a, a huge infrastructure deficit in, in Africa that needs to be needs to be filled. So I think that the, the, there is an insufficient understanding yet amongst um, a lot of Western policymakers about the, the need to, to look at Africa, not only in its own terms for what it needs, but also for the contribution to the climate over time. Because of course the population of Africa will um, likely double over the next 30 years. Uh, all of those people, again, will require the process of development to achieve a decent standard of living, and that is their, their right. And so I think there are three things that the West needs to focus on. The first is that Africa is in, in the situation of being one of the worst affected continents by, by, by climate change, even though it's not responsible for it, and even though its emissions still at the moment are comparatively very low compared with other parts of the world. And so what Western policymakers have got to understand is that it is their responsibility to make sure that the necessary change is happening amongst those countries that really do have the power to affect the climate. And we know that 50% of the emissions are from a handful of countries developed and developing, notably China, of course, and India. And 20 countries make up 80% of, of uh, the total emissions in the world. So you're compared with that, the continent of Africa is a very small part of the problem. But as Madam President's just been explaining, the impacts of climate change are severe in, 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 in Africa. So that's the first thing. The people have got to understand the context of this means that it is doubly inequitable for Africa to pay the price of a problem it has neither created, nor is it, at least at the present time, responsible for anything like the, the, the size of emissions, even of the smaller continents, never mind the larger ones. So first thing. The second thing is, obviously, as Africa grows, we want it to develop sustainably. And I don't think there's, as you just heard from Madam President, I don't think there's any shortage of will or desire on the part of African leaders for this development to happen sustainably, but it's got to happen. You've got to do the development. So the second part of this is for Western leaders to understand that this $100 billion a year in uh, climate finance, that has got to be met. It's now being pushed back by the way to 2023 is the time when it's going to be done, but it's going to be done. And it's got to be combined with the right measures to attract private finance into investable projects in Africa. One of the things that's the biggest problem in Africa is there are projects that can be done in renewables, in hydro, um, in energy efficiency, but it requires not just investment flowing from the developed world to the developing world, it requires also the harnessing of a, that large pool of international finance 
that is there actually looking for investable projects. But countries need help in putting these projects in a form which can attract private as well as public uh, and institutional investment. So that's the, 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 the second thing. So that as Africa grows, it grows in a, in a way that is sustainable. And then the third thing is frankly, there is going to be um, adaptation and mitigation. I mean, with the best will in the world, we're still also going to be trying to deal with some of the consequences of climate change that is inevitable and is not going to be reversed. And so this again requires, I think, a special focus from the Western world, this aid and development policies. And there, one final plea I'd make to Western leaders is to reduce the bu bureaucracy and accelerate the speed with which they manage to, to provide this help. You know, Western systems um, are still very bureaucratic, very slow to move. They take a long time to get to kick in with the help that uh, African countries need. And there's got to be a much better dialogue between African governments and these institutional and development partners in order that the things not just around sustainable development, but around adaptation, those things are accelerated and put in place quickly. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Blair. So you've said Africa is a small part of the problem. That, that is um, uh, one thing that we need to keep in mind. Um, even though the continent needs to develop sustainable, uh, sustainably, um, investment in climate, uh, uh, in climate finance, climate change is important and we need to reduce bureaucracy um, on the Western side of the world. Let me move to Dr. Vera Songwe. Um, nice to see you again. Um, there's clearly a, a global need to mitigate carbon emissions, but whereas many countries in the West have industrialized off of the back of fossil fuels, much of Africa is yet to industrialize. In your opinion, is it viable for African countries to develop and compete by following a completely different development path to the rest of the world? I think that's a central question here. Thank you, thank you, uh, Kamisa. Um, a pleasure to be, and an honor to be on the same uh, panel with uh, distinguished speakers, of course, Madam President. Uh, we are all following and watching and adoring you. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Tony Blair, uh, listen, I think that's a very important question in terms of sort of, do we need to follow a completely different path? I think that the objectives of all Africans are similar to the objectives of all, everybody in the developed world, right? We're looking, we're all looking for prosperity. We're all looking for a world where every girl goes to school. We're all looking for a world where every child who goes to school then has uh, a better future uh, than the future of their parents. And we know that education is important. We're looking for a world where Africa is no longer only 2% of the global market, but something better through the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. So I think the aspirations are the same. Now, are we going to follow a completely different path uh, to get to those aspirations? The, the truth is we are behind. And I think that that's a, that's a, a sort of a, a, a obvious and observable fact. Now, if you look at it, and, and Tony mentioned already, the Africa's population, 17% of the global population is African, but only 3.8% of the emissions come from Africa. 15%, uh, 15 times more emissions in the United States, seven times more emissions in China. And since we're all going to the UK, in the broader Europe, uh, the European emissions are somewhere between 12 to 13%. I say broader Europe, of course, and I see Tony smiling. So, so we do need to look at uh, uh, you know, what, what can Africa do and how can Africa do uh, differently. What Africa will do is try to leapfrog. What Africa needs to do is, is not go through the same path of coal and and fossil fuels in the way that it needs to. But however, for us to have a just equitable and inclusive transition, I think it's very important then for Africa to be allowed and, and given, uh, and actually not even to be allowed and given, but for Africa to take uh, a seat at the table and say, yes, we deserve to have this transition space. We deserve to have a transition space for gas. If Africa, for example, uh, uh, were to generate energy through gas, doubling its energy generation, the 600 million Africans today that do not have any electricity. So of course, their prospects for any kind of prosperity or a better life are lost. If we were to double our electricity generation on the continent, which means giving all of Africa access to electricity, we will only increase global emissions by 1% if we use gas. So I think we do need to look at this. Now, if we did that, and let me repeat again, 
if we were to increase double our, our energy generation, which means every African will have access to electricity, we will increase global emissions by 1%. However, by increasing global emissions by 1%, we can then move to you know, multiplication of solar and wind investments by 38%. So I think that the conversation that we're having here needs to be a conversation about how we fast track to that 38%. And as we do more of the 38, we will be doing less of gas. The discussion as, as Tony was saying on financing needs to then help Africa get gas quickly today so that in the next 30 years, Africans are all committed to zero net emissions by 2050. But we have the time between today and then to be able to put in place the systems and the frameworks that will allow us to get there. If you look at countries like Germany that are still asking for 16 years to retire coal, well, you know, China is still asking for, you know, 10, 20 years to retire coal. Japan is still looking to retire coal. It's very difficult then to look at, you know, Africa has two countries that are still using coal at massive levels. And South Africa is already decommissioning its coal plants. So how can South Africa be decommissioning its coal plants and trying to move to renewable energy and us saying, no, we won't let you do that in a time frame that is acceptable, just and equitable. So I think this is really the big issue. Now, if we were able to use renewables and so Africa is going to move to renewables, but the second thing that we do say Africa has not contributed a lot to climate change. What we don't say is that even though we have such a little, a, a small, a uh, uh, portion of the emissions. A lot of our energy capacity on the continent is already renewable because as we heard from other president, we're using a lot of hydro already. A lot of Africa's generation is hydro and we need to continue using hydro as we go forward. We've seen that and we've done some studies with the London School of Economics. If we use more solar, uh, we will have 180% return on our, on, on our utilities in DRC, 200% uh, return on investments in onshore wind in the Republic of South Africa, 280% return in biogas plants in Kenya, 480% returns in solar power desalination in Egypt. This is the business proposal. Business needs to come to the continent, not because it's a, a kind thing to do, but because it's good business. I don't think that there's many places in the world where you get 120% return on your investment. And I must say that there has not been any investment in the energy sector on the continent that has gone belly up. And so essentially it's still a good investment destination. Now what we need to do, and I'm closing, is the financing. We need to ensure, as Tony said, that that financing comes and it's crowded in. We think today we talk a lot about moving to you know, renewable energy, but when Africans issue green bonds on the global market, the premiums on those bonds are the same like vanilla bonds. So we don't get any credit for issuing green bonds on the African continent because we continue to pay what I call a liquidity premium. So the liquidity premium holds whether it's a green bond or whether it's plain vanilla. What we need to now do is say, we must give Africa, you know, take away that liquidity premium, use the SDRs. For once in a lifetime, we have $650 billion of additional resources that have been injected into the global economy. Africa is only getting 5% of that. Can we see whether we give Africa 15, 20, 25% of that to ensure that this transition that we do is done well, is done right, and is done at a cost that actually, you know, staves away inflation. We see, you know, social discontent on our continent today because of inflation, because of a rising price in energy and food. And I think using some of these additional resources to help African countries transition uh, to renewable energy is going to be the right way to go. So in short, the answer to your question is Africa is going to do differently, but we can do faster. And we need the objectives that we're trying to get to a prosperous meeting agenda 2030, agenda 2063 of Africa is the same objective the West is looking for, but we need the financing and we need a different model for doing that financing on the continent. This is extremely clear. One main takeaway here, you said zero net emission by 2050 is possible for the African continent. We have time to put systems in place. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, Professor Osimbajo, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Wow. So you've, you've been a vocal advocate of, of a just transition, um, of one which allows Africa to continue to extract and develop fossil fuels. Recent announcements from Western governments look to be pushing in the opposite direction. Can you set out 
for why African countries should be able to continue to extract and use hydrocarbon resources. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry I'm joining this late. I wish I had been uh, part of all the earlier uh, discussions. And thank you very much, Mr. Blair, for uh, providing this forum. Thank you. There's no, you know, the, 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 the real issue, as, uh, as we see it, is that for most developing countries, especially African countries, we're faced with not just a climate crisis, we're faced with maybe an even more significant existential crisis, which is development. Because of all the issues, as you're well familiar, you know, the issues of poverty, you know, and everything that attends uh, uh, poverty. So, so really, we are challenged, uh, perhaps even more significantly in, in those terms than, than, than perhaps even the climate crisis. Although, you, you'll even find that, you know, especially here in Nigeria, which uh, is my, my frame of reference, you know, there are so many uh, weather events today that significantly affect productivity, you know, uh, flooding and all of that, that tell us that there is a huge climate crisis out there. But of course, you know that this, uh, uh, that, that, that we are the worst sufferers, possibly the worst sufferers, and the least um, guilty of pollution or the least pollutants. So I, I think that what we're saying is that we cannot afford a situation where we're just pushed in the general direction of uh, zero emissions by 2050, especially by the defunding of, uh, of gas projects or fossil fuel uh, uh, fossil fuel um projects all across uh, the continent indeed there is no proven record you know if you of any country being able to develop off the back of just intermittent renewables so developing countries will be put to a further disadvantage in terms of development for uh in, in terms of development because what we are being asked to do is something that's never been tried before no one else has developed purely on the back of uh, intermittent, intermittent renewables. And so you ask uh, possibly the weakest link, you know, to do the most challenging things, and somehow you expect that uh, that, that, that would be a fair thing to do. So I, I think that the, the point that we're making is that there is absolutely no, uh, we're left with no choice if, if we're not to, uh, if we're not to find ourselves in, in a position that would be much worse than where we are today, which of course would be a tragedy indeed. And I think that one other point is that even uh, in replacing the uh, in replacing pollutants such as we have, you know, especially cooking in cook uh, uh, kerosene and charcoal and all that, we're already using LPG. We have a major campaign, at least in Nigeria, on the use of LPG. And that is advancing, you know, uh, quite well. Now, charcoal and kerosene, of course, are ter you know are terrible pollutants, even indoor pollution, and you know all of what is associated. So we, we think that clearly, if we're the, if, if gas projects are defunded, it means that we're even exposed to greater pollution, especially from uh, from, from cooking. And so, uh, so I think that really. The case is, is so apparent, and sometimes I just wonder why, you know, uh, it appears that um, uh, the, we have to keep making this case as strenuously as possible, even where it is so, it uh, seems to me to be so completely intuitive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Since I have you, uh, let, me, let me ask you a, a follow-up question to that. Um, Nigeria's economy is still heavily dependent on oil and, and gas revenues. And the country seems to be needing 400 billion US dollars over the next 40 years to reach net zero. I personally don't even know how many zeros there are in 400 billion dollars. But what avenues are available to, to you to secure this finance? It seems like a, a, a lot of money that the country would be needing. Yes. How are you going to secure to secure this investment? Well, uh, first um, we drew up uh, and we drew up a transition plan, an energy transition plan, and um, 
this is possibly one of the very, we're well, probably one of the very few countries, perhaps uh, of developing nations at least, that have actually drawn up a plan and tried to cost the, the, that plan. And, and, and this is why we have the figure of uh, 400 billion uh, US dollars. Now, we mustn't forget that part of the whole, uh, this whole transition uh, to zero emissions by 2050 is a pledge by the wealthier countries to support that transition process. And that pledge began, as you know, in, uh, in, in 2015 in Paris and subsequently with um, the commitment to 100 billion US dollars annually. And now, of course, uh, that has been significantly enhanced. So we, 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 it is clear to us that there is no way of raising the kind of finance for the transition that we're talking about without the support, the promised support of the wealthier nations of the world. Because really what we are being asked to do, as I pointed out earlier, is, is, is simply to break all, uh, if you like, all conventions in development and uh, chart a path that no one has yet uh, charted before. So I think that the very first thing is that we will, of course, be relying on the pledges that have been made because there's no way we're going to raise uh, that kind of uh, money, especially just towards uh, the transition uh, to zero emissions. But of course, there are other, well, there are other initiatives that we're, uh, that we're working on. Uh, one of those, of course, uh, is uh, uh, being able to exploit our gas resources for as long as uh, as is possible, because there's I mean that is an, a, a very important issue for us. And then thereafter, of course, uh, a diversified economy, you know, um, especially around technology, would help us a great deal yeah, in, in in being able to secure significant amounts of money. But but frankly, the uh, if you look at what uh, can work, uh, we're looking at uh, Nigerian climate change finance facilities. Uh, there is one which we're working on at the moment with the AFC, uh, ARM Harith. We're trying to create uh, that facility. We think that that could mobilize up to $10 billion to finance local green projects. The federal government is also in the, on the verge of operationalizing an infraco, a um, a teen trillion infrastructure fund, that's Naira, which could have a dedicated green finance component as well as projects to reduce emissions from uh, main pollutant activities in Nigeria, such as gas flaring, domestic cooking, you know, and then the proliferation of inefficient fuels. So really, you know, we are looking at, a, 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 you know, as many uh, options as possible and, um, we, but as I said, there's absolutely, it's absolutely important that we, we get uh, the support that we require from uh, the uh, wealthier nations. And also uh, that even if uh, and, and some, some of the avenues that we had hoped we'll be able to get support from, especially for gas projects, the AFDB, for example, the AFDB is even finding it difficult to close any gas projects, uh, to close any gas deals now on account of the pressure from, you know, uh, from many of its shareholders uh, from the other countries of the world. So th those are some of the options that we're considering, you know, uh, to build the kind of resources that will be required for the transition. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Vice President. You have a plan, so wish you good luck in implementing it. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Songwe, let me, let me go to you since we're talking about climate finance here. Um, it's been a year since the deadline, the developed the develop world um, set themselves to, to be sending $100 million in a year in climate finance to developing countries. Yet most estimates actually show that we're, we're short of, of that, um, that, that pledge. What is this money needed for? Um, again, I think as the, the, the Vice President said, and good to see you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you for continuing to be a good advocate for gas as a transi uh, the transition energy. I think that it's, it's needed for three things. And the first one is really to end global poverty, right? I think we, need, we really need to keep our, our eye on that sort of global aspiration. 
and that, that's where we start. And then we come to, to the continent and we say on the continent, for example, we have 70% of the people who live in the rural areas working in agriculture. For us to be able to change, and, and this year at the United Nations, we're also talking about the Global Food Summit and how we can you know, uh, consume better and differently. And, and for us to be able to do that, for us to be able to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of investments in agriculture that also will contribute eventually to the reduction in global emissions, we need to finance you know, uh, uh, the cost of agricultural inputs. That's what we need those resources for. I think uh, the vice president talked about the fact that we have today still on the continent, almost 900 million people across the world that do not have access to clean cooking solutions on the continent, 23 million women are hospitalized every year because of poor cooking facilities. It is needed for that. It's needed to ensure that we have better health care. And we've seen the cost of bad health care globally uh, under this COVID pandemic. It brings down your economy. It contracts growth. Finally, and, and, and you know, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. We need those resources to be able to change the way we, we, we supply and provide infrastructure to our citizens, starting from energy, of course, to roads. Madam President talked about rail and transport. The only way that we can make the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement effective is that we have better transport systems that link Cape to Cairo, Dakar to Djibouti. We need to have those railroads in place. For them to be in place, we need the investment. So again, it's about, but again, when we talk about this investment, I think for anybody in the financial sector, not only in the global North, but even in, in, in the South, because we also do want, for example, the captains of industry in Nigeria to be able to invest in Kenya and, and in South Sudan and other places. It's that these are profitable investments because, again, we have a, a, a growth as we create and generate more wealth on the continent. So it is a win win situation for resources to be crowded in. And I think that. This is not lost to the private sector. Again, to go back to Tony's point, at, at about 10 days ago with PIMCO, one of the largest asset managers in the world, we were able to do a direct investment in South Africa's renewable energy, $210 million. We are an economic commission for Africa. We don't have sort of any uh, uh, guarantee mechanisms. We don't have, but what we were able to put in place was good governance in these countries, a good investment that the private sector can see an assurance that this was a, a, an investment that will have a good rate of return for a company that has $2.2 trillion assets on the management. I think this is the beginning of a sign that the private sector, the global private sector is willing to come into Africa. Infraco, if it's in Nigeria, can come into the rest of the continent if we put in place the governance. It's more a lot about the governance on the continent, if we can improve on the governance. But in some sense, the governance is a little bit of a chicken and egg, particularly in the energy sector, because we invest a lot with, uh, 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 you know, hard currency for consumers that are going to purchase energy in local currency. And it makes a lot of these assets a little bit, you know, uh, 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 difficult to repay. And so we do need to begin to work at how do we deepen Africa's capital markets so that Africa and the rest of the world can work in cohort and in concert together to improve on this investment. So th those resources are needed. Social sectors, we need, we've seen with the COVID crisis, the need for social protection, but a different kind of social protection, a social protection that creates jobs, sustainable jobs, so that people not only stay in poverty and get a handout, but that they get something that can actually lift them out of poverty. And that's also where we need the investment. I think that if we can put that package together, and again, I go back to the SDR, $650 million issued to the global community. Africa only got 5% of that. I think if we could get 25, 30% of that, we will begin to give Africa a real solid chance of looking at how it can grow out of this crisis. But when Africa grows out of this crisis, we take the rest of the world with us because it's not just that Africa does not pollute. When we look at the pitlands in the Congo Basin, we are sequestering 30 billion tons of carbon. Now, if the people in the pitlands around the Congo and the DRC and all that stretch do not have the resources they need to conserve the, 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 that infrastructure and find alternative ways of cutting trees and building their houses, they will cut the, the pitlands. And we've seen what happened in Latin America and the Amazon, where the Amazon became a, went from a carbon sink to a carbon emitter. This is the risk that the world faces if Africa doesn't have the resources it needs to address some of the problems uh, uh, that it has today. We will then become a larger carbon emitter as opposed to what we are today, which is a global carbon sink. And for that, we need a price on carbon. 
uh, to be able to ensure that Africa is not just asking for handouts in terms of aid and donations to respond to the climate crisis, but that we level the playing field and that a, a global price on carbon to the tune of $50 uh, a ton is actually awarded and places them, you know, if you created a green carbon fund for Africa using those carbon prices, then we will be able to respond to many of the challenges that Madam President and Mr. Vice President have, have mentioned. Thank you, uh, Vera. So the stakes here is just that we don't want Africa to be a larger carbon emitter. So thank you for, for uh, your remarks. Madam President, let me, let me um, uh, ask you this. Climate finance, what are the financing gaps um, that are in Tanzania to address some of the issues that we've mentioned during this, this conversation? Talking of financing gap, uh, as you have heard me, that Tanzania is um, severely hit by the, 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 the weather effects on climate change, but then uh, the adaptation process needs a lot of money. Needs a lot of money of which they have not been given to, 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 to the developing countries like, like ours. So we have been trying doing a, a adaptation our own funds, or maybe little funds which have been given under bilateral arrangements. But then um, there is a big gap, not only for Tanzania, but for the whole of Africa. There are estimates that uh, with the uh, adaptation process, Africa needs about $50 billion by the year 2050, which we don't have hope to get them anyway with the trend of financing, which we are seeing now, it's not easy to raise that amount of fund. So I think uh, the, the developed countries have to be transparent on financing. As Dr. Vera said, that they have to increase the amount of uh, uh, financing Africa from 5% to at least 25-30%. There is a lot to be done. And the fact that uh, Africa is a carbon sink, so we have to protect it. Otherwise, it has been nicely uh, expressed here that um, if we don't get the funds to protect them, we are going to cut them, we are going to destroy them. So there are gaps which we think, uh, yeah, but apart from financing gaps, there is uh, an issue of technology transfer, capacity building, uh, research and systematic observation are also key factors to be addressed. So Africa, I think, needs a lot. We have to sit down with those who, have, who do have the expertise and um, let them uh, understand what we want, as Mr. Tony Blair said, and they should fund us on what we want and not what they want. Thank you. Thank you for this, Madam, uh, Madam President. Well noted. Uh, Mr. Mr. Blair, um, in a recent op-ed, you stated that if Africa were to follow the development path undertaken by the West, there would be a climate catastrophe. That was a, a very strong statement to make. Surely, um, going beyond existing uh, climate finance commitments is a is a matter of enlightened self interest. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree, um, <clears throat> Commissioner. I think I want to make one general point, then some specifics. And I think I'm going to make the general point by reference to the issue that. Um, the Vice President of Nigeria raised, and indeed Madam President has just been talking about this now. It's going to be necessary to use gas as a transitional uh, fuel. And doing that is essential not only for development, but also for the environment. Because if you, if, if, if you're not going to use gas, the likelihood is you're going to end up using fuel that is actually much more damaging for the environment. Okay. Now, that's an example of what I call practical policy. 
So we just did a paper recently from the Institute explaining why, you know, Africa does need to use gas as a transitional fuel, as indeed the West itself has been doing for quite some considerable period of time and is going to carry on doing, as we can see from the problems around gas supply now in, in, in Europe. And I, I raise that point in order to say that in my view, what is necessary now is that I don't think there's a shortage of political will on climate change. I, I really don't. I think most people internationally today accept, yes, it's a huge problem. Yes, we should really be dealing with it. But there comes a moment in any campaign when, if I can put it quite bluntly, you need to take it out of the hands of campaigners and put it in the hands of people who are engaged in practical policy making. Because otherwise you end up with unrealistic policies or you end up with ambitions that are mighty, but not, but not combined with policies that, that, that are going to be effective. So what does that mean in, in practical terms then when you look at the situation of, of, of Africa? I think it requires for the, the West to, to formulate a new partnership with Africa, which breaks down the different issues that it needs to deal with and does so in a practical way. So what, what does that mean in practical terms? One, as I was saying earlier, to help put the project for clean energy and development in Africa on an investable footing. Because Vera made a very important point, which is basically, by the way, when people come and invest in Africa, the rates of return are usually pretty good. And the risks are never as great as people think they are. But Africa pays a huge risk premium because people think the risks are much greater. So this requires cooperation between the international financial institutions and the private sector, because it's not just uh, PIMCO, as Vera was saying, but you've got BlackRock and other major institutions. These people are putting trillions of dollars of investment out into the world. They actually are prepared to put that money into investable projects. You know, interest rates, as we know in the West, are very low. They may rise a bit, but they're still very low. So you've got pension fund capital in the West looking for, again, investable projects. We need this organized. So one part of this partnership should be to organize climate finance in a way that deals with the different aspects necessary to put these projects in investable form. Just to give you two big projects, with these are large scale projects. There are many small scale projects you can do, but two large scale projects. You've got the Inga Dam, which people have talked about for years and years and years, which potentially is the biggest hydro project the world has ever seen. Even if you divide it up into chunks, it's still a huge project, but it's something that is enormous. If you can de-risk it, it's got enormous capacity to help. And then you've got the Africa Development Bank's idea for solar power across the Sahel, which is a, a, a 10 gigawatt plan, which again is a, of, of enormous consequence for those countries. But again, you have to put it in investable form. You have to de-risk it. You have to put the right measures of insurance in place. So that's one aspect of it. Second aspect is what the uh, um, Madam President was just talking about, which is transfer of technology. These technologies are developing and accelerating all the time, but we need a, a way of ensuring that, that they're able to be uh, transferred. And then thirdly, Governments also need help with the right regulatory framework because this is also partly a governance issue. Now, my team as uh, the vice president um, of Nigeria well knows my, my team was, was actually worked with his office in a particular project that we did, which is an interesting example of what you can do, which was essentially to get more people joined up to the grid in Nigeria because when they're off grid, they're usually using um, uh, fossil fuel generation, which can be both high cost and high emission. By joining more people up to the grid through the regulatory reform process that the vice president put in place, they, they, they will save on an annual basis, I think I'm right in saying, somewhere in the region of three and a half million tons. That's literally the equivalent of 3,000 megawatts of, of solar power. Now, that was through regulatory changes that the government was prepared to make. So the other thing, part of this partnership between the developed world and, and Africa should be assistance on what works, what doesn't, what is necessary to put in place in governance and regulatory terms in order to enable 
again, much more investment to happen and many more people to get joined up to the proper supply of electricity through the grid. This would make an enormous difference in practical way. I mean, for example, the, the amount of uh, wood that is burnt on, on for, for cooking fuel, you know, if you, if, you, if you add up the effect of that on the climate and indeed on health across the continent is fast. So this is, so my plea as we, maybe it's gonna be something that happens as we come out of COP. You've got to get to practical plans to deal with this. Otherwise you're gonna have these massive ambitions, huge commitments, but my fear is there's going to be a big gap uh, and that gap's called reality. And these plans, if they're not, if they're not realistic, they're not going to work, and in the end, people won't accept them. Thank you, Tony. So we heard your plea. We need practical plans. We need realistic plans. Ambitions are great, but we need to be able to implement um, what we want to see on the African continent when it comes to <clears throat> climate change financing. Madam President, um, you will be attending COP26. What will you be looking for uh, from for Tanzania? as main takeaways for African leaders. What are your expectations of COP26? My expectations are that um, there will be a faithful discussion on how to combat the effects of climate change worldwide. And that, uh, and that uh, combating, combating these effects it's not only helping the individual countries, but the entire humanity, the universe. And uh, as I said before, that uh, our continent, Africa, is, is, uh, is receiving a lot. It's a carbon sink. And uh, we do have a lot of effects from the weather, weather events or extreme weather events. So I would like to see uh, countries sitting together discussing, as Mr. Tony Blair said, that uh, the developed world has to understand our plans on how to go about our challenges so that together and, and transparently, we can discuss them. They should be ready, as I said before, to help us in expertise to, 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 to combat or to work on various challenges of climate change. So my, my, my expectation in, uh, in Glasgow is, to, um, is to, to, to work on the Paris Agreement and uh, own what we have agreed before. Uh, at least they should show that they are ready to, to, de, uh, to disperse $100 billion yearly so as to support developing countries fighting the, the, the effects of uh, uh, climate change or climate challenges. That's my expectation. Thank you very much, Madam President. Mr. Vice President, Your Excellency, are you optimistic about COP26? Well, um, I, I, I dare not say I'm not, frankly. <laughs> I, I, am, I, am, I am optimistic. I mean, it's an opportunity to, to, um, to talk. It's an opportunity to engage. And I think that we really need to engage. Uh, and uh, I think also that it's, it's an opportunity for us to and I, I think I really like uh, what um, uh, uh, Mr. Blair said about creating a new partnership with Africa on climate change. I think we just need to change the direction of the conversation, especially as it affects Africa, and then talk in concrete terms about what the implications of uh, net zero emissions by 2050 or whenever will mean for Africa and the world. So I think that conversation needs to change. We need to... Uh, engage in practical, so we say this isn't going to work. So what are we putting on the table? What are the practical plans that we need to have on the table? How will it be funded? How, you know, and I think uh, some of what has been said already, especially about uh, 
investable uh, uh, investable projects and all of that and making sure that we're able to tie this to investments so that it makes business sense it makes commercial sense and it's not just a situation where people are being asked to make uh, significant commitments at a time when everyone is uh, is a bit irritated by the aftermath of um, the pandemic and people don't really want to make any serious commitments or make commitments that they won't um, they won't live up to them. So I, I, I think it's an important, it will be an important forum to talk about what we really could do in concrete terms. And especially, and I really like the, the, the idea of uh, a new partnership with Africa on, on, on climate change. Because really, I think a lot of the conversation that's going on at the moment is uh, going at, it certainly is over the heads of um, many of us in Africa for the simple reason that the, the, the issues that concern us are not, are not uh, on the table. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Vice President. In our um, recent paper um, on a just transition at the Institute, we argue that Africa needs to be front and center in all of these uh, discussions. Whilst the continent has contributed almost nothing to the current crisis, it is said to face some of its worst consequences, including natural disasters and increased food insecurity. And we've mentioned um, these uh, two plights during our um, conversation. There are increasing concerns that the global response to the crisis is not taking um, those specifics into account. The Tony Blair Institute is, is privileged to partner with 17 governments across uh, the continent of Africa. And it has been my honor to host our distinguished panel here today to discuss their hopes for COP26, to discuss climate finance, and to discuss their own challenges when it comes to climate change in their specific countries. Thank you also to all our participants who've been actively listening. This concludes our conversation. Goodbye and see you all very, uh, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>